So uh, we'll get started with the next talk, um, introducing Abhishek Chaudhary, who is the co-founder and CTO of True Foundry. Previously, he was um, senior staff at Meta, previously called Facebook. Um, and then he'll be talking about how Nats powers his deployment platform at True Foundry. I'll, I'll let him start. Hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. Uh, we have been working at True Foundry for the last almost one and a half years with Nats. And it has been a really good experience allowing us to unlock things that would have been otherwise much more difficult. Uh, okay, perfect. I mean, we have today I'm going to be mostly talking about like two things. One is our internal deployment platform, which is powered by Nats to a large extent. And then we also built a LLM uh, serving system uh, using Nats. So I'll just give a brief introduction of True Foundry. It's important to understand what True Foundry is before understanding how we use Nats. So True Foundry is basically a platform to uh, deploy our work machine learning workloads on top of Kubernetes uh, on your own cloud infrastructure. So we basically help companies deploy ML applications on their own AWS, GCP, or Azure accounts. Uh, and it kind of is a platform there on top of Kubernetes because usually data scientists are not that familiar with Kubernetes. So we kind of abstract out Kubernetes to some extent. Our architecture looks something like this. So we have something called control plane. I think it's a very familiar term in the Nutanix world. I've already heard it like three, four times since I came here. But it's basically orchestrating multiple clusters. And these clusters can be in different accounts. It can be in different clouds. It doesn't matter to us. Uh, we have a UI using which you can basically talk to the control plane and control plane talks to all these clusters. <clears throat> the user flow is something like the user brings their code and usually it's a machine learning code, but there is no difference. Like you can even deploy any Docker image using it. So there's no fundamental difference between the two. Uh, even some of, some of our customers use uh, True Foundry to power their entire software development stack. So you bring your code, you tell the control plane that I want to deploy it to this cluster. This cluster can be in any of the clouds, it doesn't matter. The control plane automatically understands the minor differences between the clouds. Like even Kubernetes is not the same across the clouds. There are different auto scaling differences, node coming up differences, uh, your drivers, your CSI drivers, your GPU operators, all, be, all will be different among clouds. The control plane understands what is the difference between these different clouds. It will convert your workload spec to the corresponding spec that needs to go on the cluster. Uh, it will automatically build the Docker image. It will push it to your Docker registry. So none of the data stays with us. It will automatically pull your secrets or your environment variables that need to be fed into the application. And then it will create that service on top of Kubernetes. And then when you request, issue a request to your service, it directly hits your service and the response goes back. So even if you take out the entire True Foundry system, your service continues to be live. So your service's reliability or latency does not get affected by anything in True Foundry. Like literally there is nothing, not a single line of code written by True Foundry that comes in the actual request part to your application. I'll just give a very brief video and here I'll also highlight a few things where you will see where Nats is being used. So you can go ahead. Uh, so this is basically the UI where you can see like different services being deployed. And then you can create a new deployment. You can deploy from a Git repo. There are other things which I'm not going to go into, but yeah, you can go ahead. You can choose a namespace where you want to deploy. And then you can choose the Git repository that you want to deploy, which branch you want to deploy. Uh, these are some GPU related things. You can define which port you want to give, what is the domain name you want, uh, and go down, yeah. And you can fix the resources. Uh, and this is where you can define, you can enable auto scaling, but I'll just set it to four replicas for now. And you can also do a blue green strategy rollout. So we give this by default on Kubernetes, which, is, which doesn't come by default uh, on Kubernetes. So you can set up blue green strategy, and then you can go ahead, you can just click on submit. So if you see this rotating thing that is coming, that is powered by Nats. That's the first application of Nats that you see. It's actually sending events from the background regarding what is the current status of the deployment. It is actually building the image for you. Uh, it is also showing it as the build has succeeded. It will now go to deployment. You can see those four pods coming up. You see this real time updates, the yellow to green that is powered by Nats. Now we'll go ahead and deploy because we had set up blue green strategy. You will see how the four pods first, a new traffic comes up, the traffic shifts, 
and then basically the blue green strategy executing. Yeah, you can go ahead. So this is getting deployed and we'll see the blue green strategy in action basically. So in blue green, like your original four parts remain and new four parts will come up, all the traffic will shift and then only the four parts will go away. So if you see like you have a preview version and you have an active version. Active was what is there, preview is the new, it's like the green of the blue green. And the traffic will shift and what we have configured here that auto promote after 30 seconds. You can also have manual promotion like after shifting the traffic, like do manual promotion or things like that. Here it's 30 seconds, so you can go ahead. You can play the video. Yeah, so it is playing. And if you see like paused auto promotion after 30 seconds. So after 30 seconds, all the traffic is going to be shifted and all the older parts are going to be killed. And this, this, uh, this preview is going to become active. Active is going to be terminated. You can play the video. Yeah. So this will, this will basically wait for 30 seconds. Uh, just go a bit ahead. Yes, and now you will see that the active will become and the older will be ter terminated. So, so this is where you saw application of NATS and the problem statement was to us was this, like we have hundreds of Kubernetes clusters. At some point it will become thousands of Kubernetes clusters. And what we need is, and you have viewers on the other side who want to see what is happening in each Kubernetes clusters. And we need to relay real time information from all these Kubernetes clusters to these viewers with authorization in between. Like we cannot let every user see every event from every cluster. So we need to control which user sees what events from what Kubernetes cluster. And this was the problem statement that we had, like how do we get this, all these events out in real time to these viewers with authorization. The second was, depending on the state of this each Kubernetes cluster, our control plane takes a lot of decisions. So we need to know the exact state of a cluster at any point of time to be able to take those decisions correctly. So we also need, so we can either query the Kubernetes API again and again, hey, what is your status? What is the status? But that is that is going to be really bad because we are going to hit Kubernetes APIs like so many times that it's just bad for the Kubernetes API server. So that's why we needed the state out so that we almost never hit your Kubernetes API server. So there is no problem with that. Like the other way that people do and view Kubernetes clusters is probably if you use a software like Lens. Uh, I don't know if uh, people use Lens here. Right, yeah. So if Lens, if you see what Lens does under the hood, it issues hundreds of calls to your Kubernetes API server. If 50 or 100 developers open Lens at the same time, your Kubernetes API server really is under a lot of load, which should never be the case. Uh, so in our case, like we actually do not hit your Kubernetes API server almost very, very less. Uh, because we just read from Kubernetes and then we create the cache ourselves. So this is the architecture that we do with NATS. Every cluster sends their events to NATS. The NATS has the real-time state of a cluster. Uh, it knows exactly what a state of a current cluster is. So we know every cluster in the system, what is the current state, and the backend service reacts to those states uh, changes and takes the decisions accordingly. And the viewer and the UI subscribes to NATS to figure out which events it's supposed to show to what viewers. And this is the authorization part that I was telling about. Like one cluster will have multiple namespaces. We allow authorization on the at the unit level of a namespace, which is also what Kubernetes RBAC is based on. You can define it on the basis of a namespace. So we need to, and in our platform, you can define like this users have access to this namespaces. So we need to be very, very careful that you're not able to see any events from any other namespace. So this is the, the NATS just stream using the NATS authorization tokens, which is kind of very complicated. I don't know if you have used NATS, but then the authorization behind NATS is extremely complicated. It's not like a simple uh, thing that you do. Uh, people have worked with NATS, but we had to tweak around it so that we are able to get this fine grained JWT tokens that allow you access to very, very specific resources. So this is roughly a, a little bit more into how we implement this. Uh, so we have Kubernetes informers that allow us to listen to those events. So we don't even query the API server. We subscribe to a Kubernetes informer, which is present in every Kubernetes cluster. So you can actually listen to all the updates and these updates flow to NATS. The update structure is, I'm guessing all of you have learned about fully about NATS in the last three sessions. So NATS has a concept of subject. We have one concept per subject. And then we have cluster name dot namespace name as another subject. And then you further go down in the resources cluster name dot namespace name dot pods, cluster name dot namespace name dot volumes like that. We have different subjects and every subject gets a series of events. And whenever a user viewers open the platform, 
they get a token which exactly says which workspaces they have access to. And that is uh, how they basically start getting the events on the UI. Uh, this is pretty much how this system we were able to build and it has been working pretty flawlessly for us for the last almost one year. There were a lot of tweaks that we had to do like making sure NATS is stable and things like that. Uh, especially the authorization part, we had to spend a decent amount of time in, but we have got the system to work at a pace where it's working for almost uh, like hundreds of 500 plus clusters in a very stable way. And this is the monitoring of NATS. Like we have dashboards and all to monitor NATS. This is another thing that we almost had to build it ourselves because we didn't find a very good dashboard online uh, that gives you all these metrics in one shot. So like this is something we raised an issue on the NATS channel also, but we were able to plot something out. Even this part was not very trivial, but we are planning to release this to open source uh, as a Grafana dashboard that you can just plug onto NATS. So this was regarding the Kubernetes cluster orchestration. There's one more interesting application of NATS, and this is like really, really interesting, like uh, how you can use NATS this part. And this is basically, how do you serve LLMs in a cross-cloud fashion? Like how many of you are familiar with LLMs? Does everyone know what LLM is? Okay, a uh, lot of people. So I'll just give a brief introduction. You have all heard of ChatGPT, right? At least everybody has heard of ChatGPT. ChatGPT is powered by a model which is called, which is a large language model. So basically, uh, these are like huge models that can kind of understand and generate English language or the human language, other languages are also coming like never before. And ChatGPT is a proprietary model. There are a lot of open source models that are also coming out like Llama, Falcon, Mistral. Have you guys heard of any of those names sound familiar? Perfect. So it is just an alternative to ChatGPT. Some of like, they're not as good as ChatGPT, but you also have the trade-off of sometimes you don't need that high quality. ChatGPT also pay a lot of money to get that. If you're doing simple, simple tasks, probably you don't need ChatGPT and even Llama 7B or 13B is good enough. And when you hear these terms like Llama 7B, 13B, 70B, just a quick, like small thing, the higher the number you uh, hear after it, 70B is going to be better than 13B. 13B is going to be better than 7B, 7B is going to be greater than, better than 1B. And uh, the more bigger you go, it's the number of parameters in the model, the more bigger you go, the better your accuracy is going to, the better performance the model will give. And like chat GPT, they say like it's uh, like multiple billions of parameters, like over 500 billion parameters. GPT 3.5, they say is like 180 billion parameters. And in open source, we have Llama 70B was the, was the biggest one, they have Falcon 180B also, but there are multiple models that have come out for uh, uh, just for context setting. Now imagine, I'll give you one use case, and this is a pretty common use case for a company that works with LLMs in a large scale. Let's say I want to deploy Llama to 13B. Now the first question you'll ask is, why even deploy Llama to 13B? Why not use ChatGPT? Why do I go deploying my own model? So there can be multiple reasons. Number one, in, in sectors like FinTech and HealthTech, you cannot send any data out of your own cloud. So you, you will have to sustain yourself with an open source model. That can be one of the reasons. The second reason can be cost, which we'll go into. Like Llama 13 b might be much more cheaper than using ChatGPT for your use case. But so these are the primary two reasons why you might think of deploying Llama 13 b and using that model. Once you have decided that, okay, Llama 13 b is the one that I want to deploy, the minimum GPU that you're going to need to deploy a Llama 13 b is kind of 800, NVIDIA 800, 40 GB GPU. These are like, for people who are not familiar with GPUs, you can think of it like in, in instance type, we have like that Intel AMD like that. NVIDIA has different series of GPUs. A hundred happens to be one of those series of GPUs. And this will kind of give you decent performance for Llama 2 13B in terms of latencies. Now, this NVIDIA 840 GB GPU, now if you see where do you want to deploy it, if you go to AWS, AWS is going to tell you, I don't have a machine that, one, that has one A hundred GPU, I only have a machine that has eight A hundred GPUs. In terms of the CPU world, it's, it's telling you, I only have a machine that has eight cores. I don't have a machine for you that has one core. If you start that machine, that machine is going to cost you $23,000 per month. If you go to, and, and this one is very, very scarce. Like I'll be really surprised if you can get five of those in one region in one AWS account. Uh, like I'll pay you for that. Like we have not been able to get more than two of those in any region. Uh, GPU, uh, if you go to GCP, GCP is going to tell you, I don't have 840 GB. I have 880 GB machines. You can take this. 
and this one is going to cost you $3,000 per month. GCP is better in availability than AWS, but not quite there. Like it's very non-deterministic. You start it during the US timings, chances are very less, you'll get a machine. If you start it during India timings, chances are higher that you'll get a machine. Uh, Azure, if you go to, Azure will tell you, I also have 880 GB machines. And Azure has good availability of machines in certain regions. So in some regions, you'll get like 20 machines, some regions you get another 20 machines. Now, looking at this stat, like how do you, what do you design? Where do you host your GPs? The next question that will come is, let's imagine my traffic is 100 requests per second. For 100 requests per second, this one 800 GPU can give you an RPS of one request per second. So GPUs are not tremendously, it's not that you'll get a thousand, 10,000 RPS that we talk about. You're not going to get it with one machine. You're going to get literally one request per second throughput on one GPU that you're paying $3 an hour. Uh, so you will, you will say that I need 100 GPU machines. The problem statement is where do I get this 100 GPU machines? Let's evaluate the cost. Imagine, let, let's go there later. Like first question will be, tell me the ROI. How much am I going to spend on this? If you count earlier, $3,000 was one machine. To serve this traffic, I will need, I'll be spending $300,000 every single month. That's the cost we are looking at. Uh, just to serve a traffic of 100 RPS. The same traffic, I, was, I told you we'll do the cost estimation. If the same traffic you had sent to GPT-4, your cost would have been $17 million a month. So you can see the order of difference. If you had gone to GPT-3.5, your cost would have been $800K a month. And now the, the argument is more clear that, okay, why do I go for Lama 13B and why do I not go for chat GPT? Because in some cases it makes sense when you need that, when you have that use case. If you're just doing a classification, if it's a positive or a negative, Lama 213B is going to do as good a job for you as ChatGPT is going to do. So now you saw that, okay, I need 300K dollars, but where do I put the, where do I put? I, I, it's probably almost impossible to get 100 GPUs in one region in one cloud. The moment you have that constraint, you have to go multi-cloud now. Multi-cloud and multi-region. So that is the first thing. And then you might also ask that, okay, can we do spot or something like, can you reduce this cost from 300K dollars per month? So this is what we came up with, like this architecture, which will, I'll go into, to kind of, first of all, deploy this in a multi-region, multi-cloud way, without you bearing all the operational burden of it. And then we'll go into how, what we did to reduce the costs. So fundamentally what we did was, that is the HTTP service that you have written on the right side. Don't make any changes to that HTTP service. That is the same HTTP service you are going to host for Lama 213B. It will probably have a predict endpoint, which you will call, in case of LLMs, it's called generate endpoint. Most LLM servers will do that. They will give you a generate endpoint. You hit it with a prompt, you're going to get back a response. It's as simple as that. What we do is we put a small sidecar in front of it. Every single HTTP service spot, there is a sidecar. And there is a gateway that we put. So the same HTTP service call request that you're going to send to that HTTP service, send it to this gateway. The gateway is going to put it to NATS. That sidecar is going to dequeue that message from NATS send it to your HTTP service again as an HTTP. So you serialize the request in the middle, you deserialize the request there, you send it to HTTP service, get back the response, send it to back to NATS, this gateway sends back the response. So your client side needs zero changes, your server side needs zero changes, and you suddenly have made your infrastructure. Like now you can put multiple copies of that HTTP service anywhere. I don't care where that HTTP service is running. You can put it on your own laptop, you can put it on 10 different clouds, 10 different regions, it doesn't matter because you have this gateway and your NATs that orchestrates, that's a single ingress that you're getting to orchestrate all the requests. Uh, you might argue that why, uh, like, are we not incurring additional latency in the middle? If I was to hit the HTTP service directly, I would have got a minimal latency, then I'm going via NAT, then sidecar, then this. It's introducing two more hubs in the middle. Yes, it does introduce additional latency, but that's of the order of, uh, 10 to 20 milliseconds uh, with NATs. And uh, the latency that we are looking for LLM requests is of the order of two to five seconds. So when your, when your response times are of the order of like, maybe one second is the minimum, one second to five seconds, you don't really care about that 10, 15 milliseconds extra in that response latency. And anyways, a good thing about LLMs is your responses are in a streaming format. So the user, the user perceived latency is actually very, very, it's almost negligible because you're constantly getting partial responses as you're doing it. By the way, like that was one more problem that we had to solve. That HTTP service is not responding to me in one shot. That HTTP service is returning me a streaming response. 
how do you relay that streaming response over NATS? So that was one of the other things that we had to solve this in this problem. We took that thing, the same thing, we created all these GPU pools. Every region, every cloud, everything on spot. Every single, ju this pool is running on spot. Uh, no on-demand machines were there. The advantage of this thing is, even if one cloud runs out of GPU, you have the other one to make, make up for it. You can afford spot because all multiple region, multiple clouds are not going to take down your spot at the same time. We were able to get, we are running 100 GPUs fully on spot, and then you can put other, pool, other providers and things like that. The other advantage of this thing is auto scaling. Usually GPU machines will take a lot of time to come up. One GPU machine, like if you need one more machine to come up, and this is not like CPU machines that you will probably get one more pod in the same box. Uh, in CPUs, like you probably have some spare capacity in some box and the pod will come up really fast. In GPU, it does not work like that. One, one machine is almost running one pod because it's almost saturating the GPU. So you will have to bring up a machine. Now time to bring up a machine in AWS is two minutes. In, in GCP, it's or, or order of four to five minutes. In Azure, it's of the order of eight to 10 minutes. Uh, so, so you have to like, so that actually, because what we configure is we configure each of these pools to auto scale in a different way where we want the auto scaling to happen faster. So you configure the things like, so each of these pools tries to auto scale whenever the traffic suddenly increases and the person who comes up first takes up the load and helps distribute the load. So that, that actually gives us much more advantage and we are able to run this fully in spot. So just, as I mentioned, the, a few advantages that we got, one was higher reliability that we got. Uh, we got better auto scaling support cost savings. Just to give an idea. Now we are incurring hundred K dollars per month, which would have been taken you 300 K dollars per month. Just to give you a idea, like this was $17 just to reiterate, it was $17 million on chat GPT four and 800 K dollars on GPT 3.5. Uh, that cost has now gone down to hundred K dollars per month. Uh, this has been running for over six months, zero, zero downtime. And, uh, and minimal additional latency, as I mentioned, 10 to 15 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, like when you're really going cross region, it can go up to, we have seen going it up to 30, 40 milliseconds also, but it really doesn't matter because the user never sees any of it. In this, we got some few key learnings. It was not easy to build this and this required a lot of iteration, especially like a few things I'll highlight and those problems will become very clear. I'm not going to go into all the solutions now, but for example, uh, one, one case was uh, in HTTP, what happens? If you have a sudden surge of requests, some of your requests will start giving you a 500 error. If your load is, if a server is not able to take up the load, you start getting 500 errors. But when you retry or you issue new requests, those requests will go in because those requests have errored out. In case of NATs, you are enqueuing all the requests. So if you ever pile up all the requests, your NATs is actually going to finish all the requests even though the client has disconnected. Your client made a request to the gateway, now client is maybe client has a timeout of 30 seconds. Now client will disconnect after 30 seconds, but you have enqueued the message in NATS and nobody's there to pull it up. So then all those pile up will first be processed by NATS and you kind of enter into a state where you are just bogged down by your previous uh, backlog that you're not able to process new requests. So we had to do something like flushing in NATS that kind of flushes away the NATS for which client has already disconnected. Like client is not asking me for that response anymore. So we had to flush out that messages in NATS. The second problem was when we went cross region in NATS, within the same region in NATS, everything worked perfectly. But the moment you go cross region in NATS, especially in the NATS, like client libraries, like Python and all, uh, there are some issues when you start having this random network flakiness, like suddenly you will not be able to connect to NATS or you will, you'll have, you'll face this random disconnects and things like that. And we are working on that, fixing that issue now. Uh, but these are some of the things where you have to implement retries in multiple, multiple areas or fallbacks uh, to make sure that the system is stable. Uh, when we use NATS consumer, like core NATS consumer, uh, I don't know if you know this part about NATS, but NATS has this thing of a queue group where when you send a message, one person in that group will receive the message. It doesn't do a very good job of, of load balancing. Like if you attach 10 replicas and you say that one person will receive the message, it does random. If you need read NATS documentation, it does random distribution. Random distribution somehow does not work very well for this LLM use cases because once you bog down a machine, that GPU is almost gone. Uh, it creates this huge queue inside that GPU and you're pretty much done. So we had to 
we could not use nats automatic load balancing we had to use a pull consumer so that was one of the other things that we had to do uh, and this is pretty much the learnings that we had while building this and that's all from my side thank you great talk lots to learn but um any any questions from the audience before we move over to questions from um online folks hey hi abhishek yeah hi so i have uh, questions in two categories one is on nats and one is on kubernetes right okay so you mentioned that you you are actually managing around 500 different clusters so that's right. huge so first question is is it on cloud on spot instances or is it on premise as well uh so the clusters are aws azure gcp a couple of our customers run some uh, what is that called oracle for uh, oracle has a kubernetes engine right rke or something like right? as long as we have a kubernetes distribution it doesn't matter to us okay. so even clients connect their own kubernetes clusters we don't go in that path so we kind of give you an agent that you install on any kubernetes cluster and you connect to the control plane yeah so the consecutive question is now you were saying that all the events from your kubernetes clusters are being streamed to nats right right so on an average per second how many events does that result in on the cluster in terms of load on the nats so, cluster uh, just a clarification we don't listen to every single event okay. we only listen to events that we are interested in oh. so so you have an agent on the kubernetes cluster that filters out events yes, that you want yes exactly so we don't do we don't black blanket listen to everything okay. we only listen to things that we show on the ui uh so the specific applications that belong to your things we listen to that okay. uh and on an average it it does result like per per cluster we have like hundreds of events coming in okay uh per second so it can it depends on size of the cluster also if you have running three nodes in a cluster your events are going to be less if you are running 100 nodes in a cluster your events are going to be highly uh, like much more one last question for that jwt token and kubernetes probably you're linking service accounts to jwt is that what you're doing uh So you're granting access to namespace, right, on the Kubernetes cluster per user. So we don't we don't relay the R back to Kubernetes. Okay. So it's on our system that you say I have access to this namespace. Uh huh. So you never get a cube config. So you don't even have to distribute a cube config to your users. Understood. Because we kind of pull the state and we manage it and then we relay what needs to reach to you. So uh, what service account comes when you are actually using the Kubernetes R back. we don't use kubernetes are back we don't configure things on the kubernetes level you don't even need to give access to kubernetes or cube config or circulation none of that is needed and that was one of the things we had to do because uh, somehow we realized that the infra teams are really scared to distribute cube configs to developers or data scientists and all and that kind of breaks that loop where they are not able to do anything on their own especially in case this is some problem that data scientists face where they have to work on gpus and all or machines that they cannot work on their laptop there is no way they can test their code on their own machine so they need the cloud machines and that's why they need access to direct kubernetes and infra teams are not ready to give that so that's why we had to kind of do this thing but you don't need to give a cube config you still can do whatever you want thank you any other questions uh maybe i didn't uh, get the point where is your nats itself running where is the nats server running in the control plane in the control plane in which of these clouds so control plane we are, we host our control plane on aws it's a hosted control plane that shared between multiple customers so so the messages come from the kubernetes cluster of the customer gets generated there from the and the agent picks it up Correct. puts it into the nat server that is running in your own control plane which is running in aws correct that then distributes i mean the nat the core nat server is in aws correct for our enterprise customers we also ship them the control plane okay so in that case the control plane goes also in their cloud got it yeah, because because in the case where the control plane itself is running in aws the latency between the aws nat server the network latency between and the azure where your llm is that itself will be quite significant right yeah so that one as i mentioned for the llm part we see cross region latencies of like 40 50 milliseconds is the maximum we have seen okay because it's a persistent connection it builds it just has to send the message so it's only the cross region latency that you are seeing okay uh, so we don't really uh, in the llm case we that's the maximum latency we have seen for nats to incur in, in between god okay thank you yeah yeah there is one more 
Hi, uh, so I have uh, two questions uh, similar to his. So one is a Kubernetes sort of question. So um, for every new customer that you have coming in, are you using a namespace within a particular Kubernetes cluster to separate them from other customers or do you have a dedicated cluster for each customer? So customer brings their cluster. We don't provide Kubernetes clusters. Customer spins up a cluster in their AWS account and connects it to our control plane. Okay, got it. So you just provide the scaling capability as a solution. We just really... provide the control plane with the UI and the deployment capability. So if you go to this architecture, wait, this is stopped working. Can you enable this thing? It's not, or can you go back the slide? Yeah. So, so if you see these, these clusters that you see on the right side, they are all brought by customers. We don't provide those Kubernetes clusters and they, our control plane is hosted at like, let's say x.trufondi.com. So the agent connects to this control plane and that you get a token through which you connect. Okay, I uh, got it. Uh, so the second question is with respect to NATS itself. So as you have more and more customers coming up and uh, generating events to your NATS server, right? So how are you actually scaling your NATS? Like how big is your cluster? NATS, we don't need a lot of, like five nodes we are doing currently. Okay. It's working out pretty well. Even, even for the requests that you're talking about serving, not just uh, monitoring. Oh. In this one, so you're no. talking about the LLM serving use. Ah, yes. LLM service, you're talking about 100 requests per second. Okay. The request per second is really low from a, any traffic standpoint. It's just because it's GPU, it sounds very big and the cost is very high. 100 requests per second is almost nothing for any microservice. Like we are all used to. For a single customer, yeah. But oh, since... this one. This use case, like gateway. So gateway layer, we are currently not sharing. We kind of give this completely thing to every customer. Exactly. Okay, so you replicate this for every customer. We replicate this because oh. this is a really lightweight stack. We don't have to like, we are currently not sharing. Maybe we'll share it in the future, but okay. we don't like, we don't have hundreds of customers using this system. We only have two, three customers using this system at this point, to okay. be honest, because not, there are very few people who are spending this much amount on hosting LLMs, uh, 100K a month. You can think like it's a huge amount of investment. And there are very few companies that are doing this today. Thank you. So yeah. in the future, we can make this multi trend but I don't expect this to be a bottleneck ever because you, you can see like it costs you hundred thousand dollars to serve hundred requests per second and NATS can scale up to 10,000 requests per second. Things like that is very easy for NATS to scale up. So we have a scope of going hundred X before we hit uh, the scaling constraints and all. Yeah. Uh, one question. So when you mentioned about the queue groups uh, that you are facing a difficulty, right? What exactly is that? I, I didn't get it actually. So what, what Nats was doing is it was doing, so we, we put a load balancer in the front and we put this HTTP service behind the hood 10 replicas and we started hitting the load balancer. We found that the, it was much more uniform than when we put Nats and we allowed Nats to send randomly to this 10 subscribers because of which what happened was if you, we saw the latency patterns and all in case of load balancer, the latency was kind of a flat line in, in, uh, in Nats, the P99 was a very jittery because the amount of some servers were getting more requests in one shot and some servers were getting less requests in one shot. So our P99 latency was kind of becoming very, very jittery with NATS queue groups. Similar hundred requests per second. Similar. Yeah. Hi. So uh, all these uh, GPU pools are in same region or as you're saying, cross region, cross country. Cross region, cross cloud, we don't care. Achha. Wherever you get the spot. Wherever you get a spot. Wherever you get. Yes. Okay. Cool. Because the latency, the only problem with cross region is latency. And in this, in this LLM serving use case, latency no longer becomes a concern. Hey, hello, Bishu. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question around the, uh, it's like a kind of a scenario. I don't know whether you're faced or not. So uh, you mentioned that you are deploying an agent on the Kubernetes cluster, which is sending the events. So what if the cluster gets into the uh, infrastructure upgrade state? So what happens to that agent? So will it stop sending an events or how that, right. how that scenario is handled? Correct. So you are saying that we run an agent, what if the agent goes down? That's exactly. the question. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So because uh, uh, like you mentioned, you are upgrading That's from right. the application perspective, not from the infrastructure perspective. Correct. So. Yes, if the agent goes down, our UI will not show you the lifetime events. But one thing that is that is something that we are living with. But what we are not living with is so on every agent restart, we rebuild the state. So that is an advantage that we have. That even if you bring down the entire NATS, we can bring we can rebuild the state entirely in, in a matter of one minute. 
all 500 cluster state will be rebuilt in one minute. So we keep refreshing the state and that's why we are able to do this eventually consistent thing also. Because we cannot rely that if one event gets missed, we have a wrong state of the cluster. So we have to keep resyncing the state at regular intervals. But that is a much, much more infrequent operation and it doesn't cost us anything. So every time an agent restarts, we rebuild the state. Uh, sorry, not exactly tech related, but uh, you said like very few companies like do this and uh, that's why your rate is like 100. So what generally what kind of companies or what category of companies do you have as customers? So, uh, so you're talking about the LLM serving thing, yes. right? For the Kubernetes part, any company can be a customer, it doesn't matter. For the LLM serving, uh, these are mostly chatbot companies. Like, uh, I don't know if you have heard of character AI things like that, where you go and write a prompt and there are multiple, multiple users that are writing a prompt and you're giving a response. So any sort of chatbot company will usually need uh, these kind of LLMs hosting. And as I think this is currently, few companies are using it, but this use case is only going to grow with time as you use more and more AI. There are currently there are very few companies using AI. That's why this is like this. So, so are you aware of like how NATS authorization works like account and then you have under account, you have like one more level and then you have subjects, channels and things like that. I, I also had that question. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, we, we understand that. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at this diagram, I can have, imagine like 10 clusters here and I have N1 from one cluster, N2 from second cluster, N3 from one cluster like that. So we had to we issue JWT tokens that allow you to subscribe to only those channels. And we have to do this on the fly. Usually NAT's configuration is, it's easier to give it by resolver.conf and things like that, where you give a static configuration with credentials. But we don't know who is logging and what credentials, like we cannot generate one token per user. So we have to generate these tokens on the fly as the user logs into the system. And the moment, one more thing. Today you have access to, viewer one has access to N1, N4. I gave them access to N10. I can do it by the UI, but you, your token needs to be refreshed at that point. Otherwise you are not going to get uh, access to N10. So those things, those are the things that we had to like kind of, uh, those are the things that became quite complicated, at least uh, for us when we were doing it. Have you tried a leaf node on the customer's Kubernetes site and that handles that and the leaf node then connects to your uh, own NATS cluster in your control plane? We haven't tried that, but happy to try it. Like that, that's similar to our agent. Like our agent will, at the end of the day, you have to first read from the informers and then you can put it to the leaf agent here and that will replicate it there. Correct. Correct. Right. But you uh, talked about the flakiness earlier, right? Here we are not seeing that much flakiness okay. in this one somehow, uh, because here it's not a Q group or those things are not involved. Mm. So we are not seeing this much flakiness and the, and the good thing here is no, we are, what we have seen is we are rebuilding the state. Every 10 minutes or every 20 minutes to rebuild the state. So it really doesn't matter. Like most of the times we have, we have never encountered an issue there, but we can, we can do that. Like probably that's a good idea. We right. can just putting a leaf node and that will handle the syncing right, part. Right. Yeah. So one of the other issues that we found in our POC in a similar setup is while we kept in our performance test, while we kept revoking access, it goes to a revoke list, which sits with the JWT, right? And that packet starts to become very big. It went beyond one MB at one point of time. Yeah. And then we had to temporarily, you know, increase the max size of the message. And later we went ahead doing some hacks around it and stuff like that. Did you face anything like that or Not did you yet. solve for it? Not yet. Because uh, we use this thing heavily, uh, dot arrow and dot star. Okay. So, so far we haven't had to face this thing. Also like each customer we are, we don't have a customer that has like hundred clusters. We have customers have that maximum 10 clusters, each cluster, like 20 namespaces. And probably a user needs access to like two or three of them in most cases. So the order is magnitude is lower in our case so far. Okay, so okay. we haven't encountered so, it yet. Thinking again of the decentralized auth model that Nats has, um, we again had a similar use case. And then we were trying to do the mapping between um, what is a user for us and what is an account for us. In your model, this, this diagram that is there on the stage right now, right. Um, is a user your namespace in Kubernetes or? What's a user? How many accounts do you have? Like, how, how do you do that mapping? So, uh, 
user you can think of the publisher is a namespace uh, i don't know what you'd call it, and the tokens are generated for these viewers okay so so you're talking about that user concept of nats we don't correct yeah okay. we don't uh, we don't uh, you don't use accounts as a okay. we don't, we don't yeah, use that we don't use that because we had to pre configure that and that was becoming a problem we we don't we actually don't use that system that's why okay i think you can generate users on the fly we generate users on the fly. right and the generalities will sit on the customers kubernetes cluster only your centralized control plane doesn't need to have the generalities once that generality comes back to your control plane on that nats you can just understand so if it is the right we, one there we don't need jwt yeah so okay. we issue a dynamic user for this client right for the agent we issue a, we create a dynamic user that only has access to publish to cluster name dot star mm -hmm. so we issue a dynamic token there okay uh, and that can only publish to this cluster topic okay and here on the viewer side we again issue dynamic tokens that does this thing okay. sure sure so yeah sure sure yeah thank you let's talk offline about it yeah. okay any other questions um we have a few on zoom we'll get done quickly and then we'll start with the next talk uh, it is just one question this is from Karan, uh, our own Nutanix, from our team especially. Uh, how similar is this to Knative, or is it even built on it? And uh, he assumes, is it multi-cluster and spread across region and cloud? As compared to? Uh, is it, it multi-cluster, which is spread across regions and cloud? It is multi-cluster. So this is related to the LLM deployment thing. Yes, so it is multi-cluster, multi-region. There's no limitation. Uh, Knative is similar. I'm trying to think. I know Knative. I've not thought it from that perspective. Uh, Knative, you might be able to do it by Knative, but I'll have to give it a thought. I've not thought it, but I know Knative can be done in one cluster, but I don't know. I've not, I haven't given a thought if you can take it like multi-cluster and multi-region. So this one by default is multi-cluster and multi-region. 